Here is the Book of Capitalism, The Wealth of Nations, by Adam Smith. And here is the Book of Communism, The Communist Manifesto, by Karl Marx. Or is it? This is how many people in the Western world are educated in regards to these ideologies and their supposed primary literature, and it is even common to see these two literary works opposing each other on a fundamental level in educational systems. But what if I told you that this entire way of thinking is wrong? Hello everyone, my name is Danov, and today we will be engaging in some positive historical revisionism because the real history behind this topic may very well shock you. Let us start by going back to the year 1776, when the Wealth of Nations, or An Inquiry into the Nature and Causes of the Wealth of Nations, was first published by the Scottish economist and philosopher Adam Smith. The impact of this work was massive, creating the field of classical economics as we know it, and acting as the basis and or inspiration for the majority of modern economic theory, among many other things. Smith's theories and analyses were groundbreaking, and they engage in a variety of topics within political economy, the most important of which, in the historical context at least, is free trade. Adam Smith is typically remembered as the titan of laissez-faire or let-it-do capitalism, which emphasizes the importance of free trade and a lack of state intervention in economic affairs. There is also the concept of the invisible hand of the market, but this phrase is literally used only once in The Wealth of Nations, and its meaning has been so exaggerated by economic historians that I will just leave the Wikipedia article for it in the description for you to read about it yourself. While this general view of Adam Smith as the laissez-faire man is mostly true, a deeper look into Smith's theories and Marx's theories will show you a profound, positive, theoretical connection between the ideas of these two thinkers. And it should also deconstruct a lot of the invented mythology surrounding them and what they believed. In case you do not know, the capitalist ideas of Smith and the communist ideas of Marx are often painted as diametrically opposed to one another. Adam Smith the wealth of nations, and capitalism are seen as symbols of freedom and liberty, whereas Karl Marx, the Communist Manifesto, and communism are seen as symbols of totalitarianism and government control. Ooh, very spooky. One of, if not the biggest problem with this framework, is that people usually look at the Communist Manifesto as the ultimate theoretical work of Marx, and even blend this with propagandized understandings of 20th century socialist countries like the Soviet Union. In reality, the Manifesto was a 20-page rhetorical pamphlet that was published around the beginning of the revolutions of 1848, which is part of the reason why it became so famous, especially in history books. By comparison, The Wealth of Nations is a detailed piece of economic discussion with hundreds of pages of theory. This is certainly an unfair comparison, the truth is, the ultimate work for comparison here is Das Kapital, Volume 1, by Marx, which is similarly as famous as the Communist Manifesto for reasons that are closer to why the Wealth of Nations became famous. While the Wealth of Nations is the magnum opus of Adam Smith, Das Kapital is the magnum opus of Karl Marx, and both works have similarly rich, detailed, and groundbreaking economic discussion that lasts for hundreds of pages. But why is the Communist Manifesto typically chosen over Das Kapital, you may ask? Well, we'll discuss this question later in the video. Meanwhile, if you take a basic look at these two monumental works, you will see that the connection between Adam Smith and Karl Marx is much stronger than what you may have originally thought. So, we have established the incorrect nature of comparing the Wealth of Nations and the Communist Manifesto and that Das Kapital is the proper work from Marx to use for comparison. This leads us to the following question. What is the positive theoretical relationship between the classical economics of Adam Smith plus his successors, and Karl Marx? You see, Adam Smith, David Ricardo, a significant classical economist that came after Smith, and Karl Marx all subscribe to a concept known as the Labor Theory of Value, or LTV. In short, the LTV states that the economic value of a good or service is determined by the total amount of socially necessary labor required to produce it. As you can probably guess, value theories in general, which discuss fundamental questions such as the nature of values and prices in an economy, 
are arguably more essential than less concrete and less consistent ideas such as free trade, which has since evolved into more of a rhetorical support for capitalism than a concrete and consistent area of analysis within economic theory. I say this about free trade because the question of free trade during Adam Smith's life was in the context of a time where feudal or mercantilist countries imposed heavy tariffs on their goods to protect domestic producers. As a result, this free trade concept as we know it today has very much shifted away from its original meaning from almost 250 years ago, even though many supporters of capitalism still use it with regards to Adam Smith. For example, David Ricardo, who pioneered the concept of comparative advantage, forever changed the meaning and perception of free trade in modern economic theory. And today, free trade is more closely associated with neoliberalism and globalization than what Adam Smith originally wrote hundreds of years ago. Simply put, I argue that the free trade concept, which many people typically say is Adam Smith's greatest theoretical achievement alongside the invisible hand of the market, is not as great or central as the labor theory of value, and that this lack of recognition for the classical LTV has very much to do with the aftermath of Karl Marx's contribution to the field of economics, as I will explain later. Most people believe that the labor theory of value originated from Karl Marx, but this is simply untrue. Adam Smith, David Ricardo, and Marx all subscribed to and said different things about it, but Marx's analysis was, and is, the most concrete of the three. To summarize the timeline of theoretical development, Ricardo challenged and refined the original LTV ideas of Smith, and this new analysis would then be used and refined by Marx to form his economic theories, and ultimately create a core part of Marxist economics that was itself based on classical economics. This culminated in the publication of Das Kapital, Volume 1. Marx's most important theoretical work in the field of economics, where he took the labor theory of value, a principle that was used to praise and uphold capitalism by its supporters for decades, and turned the entire concept in on itself. He used the orthodox understanding of economics that was accepted by the majority of economists at the time, which promoted the capitalist system, to thoroughly expose the massive flaws, or contradictions, inherent in this system. In many ways, you could say that Marx was the ultimate classical economist of his time, but instead, the radical conclusions and critiques of capitalism that Marx made as a student of Adam Smith and David Ricardo would go on to instead cause a massive rift in the field of economics. It was almost like if an atheist used the Bible to clearly disprove the existence of God. Needless to say, Capitalists, as well as their supporters in academia, were no longer willing to uphold the labor theory of value as a core economic principle, and ultimately, due to the dominance of capitalist interests in a capitalist society, the majority of educational institutions in society similarly started to reject the LTV. Thus, the late 19th century marked the transition of the labor theory of value from an orthodox economic theory to a heterodox economic theory. At this point, we have established the strong theoretical relationship between the classical economists Adam Smith and David Ricardo, and Karl Marx. But, we still have some questions left to answer. If the theoretical relationship between the classical economists and Marx is so significant, then why is this relationship not featured as much as it should? Well, let us start where we left off. As explained in the last part, the revolutionary analysis, no pun intended, by Marx sent the academic supporters of capitalism into a frenzy in an effort to distance themselves from the labor theory of value, an economic theory that was now on the side of the workers' movement and anti-capitalist ideology. A few years after the publication of Das Kapital, which was published in 1867, a thought movement known as the Marginal Revolution emerged in the early 1870s, which was essentially the start of the economic theory of marginalism and the field of neoclassical economics, as well as the Austrian school of economics. The academic supporters of capitalism, ironically, resorted to previously heterodox theories in an effort to redefine themselves, and they ultimately chose to fall back on marginalism. The first person to be regarded as a thinker in marginalism, Hermann Heinrich Gossen, was quickly forgotten and so were his works. After Gossen's death, however, 
His works were reanalyzed and used to create a theoretical framework based on classical economics by thinkers like Karl Menger, who founded the Austrian School of Economics and pioneered the neoclassical economic approach. This new framework would gradually become the standard economic ideology in Western educational institutions, rather than Marxism, which rejected the status quo. However, this would only remain until the Great Depression, after which many institutions then moved on to the emerging economic theories of Keynesianism, at least in the macroeconomic context. This action was likely in a persistent effort to once again avoid the hard truths of the Marxist critique of capitalism, which already predicted an event such as the Great Depression several decades earlier. But now we are getting ahead of ourselves. Now, to answer the question from the beginning of this part of the video, the strong relationship between Marx and the classical economists is typically ignored because this reality undermines the entire capitalist worldview. Adam Smith is almost always regarded as the father of capitalism and modern economic theory, and David Ricardo has received a similarly positive treatment in academia. This leads us to Karl Marx, who, as I mentioned before, was a keen student of Smith and Ricardo that formed incredibly important but incredibly anti-capitalist and anti-status quo conclusions from the same template that was pioneered by these classical economists, Smith and Ricardo, who praised capitalism. It would certainly be questionable if people were told that Karl Marx, a critic of capitalism, was arguably a better classical economist than his pro-capitalist rivals and contemporaries. If Smith and Ricardo were still alive by that point in time, perhaps they would even be Marxist themselves, in a way. Remember that the people who have a monopoly on power and influence in a capitalist society are capitalists. And this power and influence also directly affects the ideological positions that educational institutions have. Institutions which are effectively maintained by the capitalist state, private donors, and other similar entities that are greatly biased towards pro-capitalist ideology. As a result, most people do not know about the Marx-Ricardo-Smith connection, the marginal revolution, and the massive changes that happened in academic institutions during the late 19th century as a reaction to the valid and hard-hitting realities of the critique formulated by Marx in Das Kapital. Now, to conclude this video, we must answer two final questions. If the theoretical relationship between the classical economists and Marx is so significant, then why are their theories depicted so differently? And, why is the Communist Manifesto typically chosen over Das Kapital in historical narratives? If the last part did not make this premise clear enough, the primary reason why Marx's theories are displayed so differently and why the Communist Manifesto is usually referenced instead of Das Kapital is because this would contradict the historical narrative established by many capitalist educational institutions. The theories of Marx as a critic of capitalism and the theories of Marx as a theoretical analyst of past and future societies can be seen as two interlinked but separate things. To give a very brief overview, Marx used the economic template created by Adam Smith and his classical successors to develop a refined understanding of the mechanisms of capitalism in Das Kapital Volume 1 and other works. Then, Marx synthesized his critique of capitalism with historical materialism, which is a conception of history that is based on the idealist Hegelian dialectic. Historical materialism, in short, explains the progression of human societies across history through material conditions, and this process leads to the conclusion of communism, or, if you want to be a pessimist, barbarism. It is important to treat capitalism, socialism, and communism as distinct stages in history, not ideological options to choose from, in contrast to the idealist way that many modern educational institutions explain the political character of Marxist ideology. Here is a quotation by Marx from the German ideology to better explain what I am talking about. Communism is for us not a state of affairs which is to be established, an ideal to which reality will have to adjust itself. We call communism the real movement which abolishes the present state of things. The conditions of this movement result from the premises now in existence. 
On top of that, I should also mention that the idea of what a communist society looks like in these types of comparisons is heavily influenced by a propagandized understanding of life in socialist countries during the 20th century. Yes, these are, in few words, socialist countries, not communist countries, and they were not like 1984 or anything similar to what Western anti-socialist and anti-communist institutions would have you believe. There is no single example of an established state with a communist ideology calling itself communist, and the most famous example of this would be the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. This confusion probably happened because communism was the ideology of these states, so there could have been a simplification of terminology for convenience, or even some scholarly dishonesty happening here. But I digress. Communist society is many things, but first of all, it is state-less. Remember that state is not equal government in the Marxist context. However, this video is not about communism, so I will not address those details here. As for the literature in question, the Communist Manifesto seems to be used as a dummy replacement for the much more theoretically significant work that is Das Kapital, which, as established previously, is a quite classical economic work in its analysis and utilization of ideas from Adam Smith and David Ricardo. And Kapital is also a work with a much closer form and function to the wealth of nations. The Communist Manifesto is also arguably more historically relevant and interesting given its proximity to the revolutions of 1848 and the mostly accurate aesthetic of revolutionary action and change that Marxism is known for. Meanwhile, Das Kapital is a more complicated theoretical work, and using it to build a narrative that favors the established academia of capitalist society is much more complex and challenging to succeed in. In the Orwellian fashion, it is sometimes better to act like it never existed, or at the very least, downplay its overall importance to the entire field of economics. Alright, now we have reached the end of the video. But wait, let me close on a fun fact. Apparently, Karl Marx is responsible for inventing the term classical economics as a means of separating the great economic theorists before his time from their so-called vulgar successors. Given how this general structure of terminology has remained to this day, it should tell you a lot about the true character of modern academic institutions in terms of economics. Maybe that is a story for another day. Overall, I hope you enjoyed watching this video. If you are new to my channel and made it this far, then please consider supporting this channel however you wish. See you all very soon.